All right, Braves fans, let's get rolling. I'm George McNair. This is State of the Braves. Well, guys, we're still in the month of January. January tends to be the dead zone of baseball news, baseball activity. Uh, the one big thing that tends to happen in January is you get the results of the Hall of Fame voting, and we got those just the other day. So I wanted to give you my reactions uh, and actually my frustration over the Hall of Fame. And, you know, as a Braves fan right now, uh, we kind of should be frustrated, especially uh, as the Hall of Fame continues to reject the candidacy of Andrew Jones. So once again, Andrew Jones comes up short of the votes needed for induction into the Hall of Fame. He received 61.6% of the vote. Uh, if you don't know how the Hall of Fame works, players need 75% of the vote from the baseball writers to be elected into the Hall of Fame. Former Braves Billy Wagner and Gary Sheffield also missed out on the vote. Um, these three guys that I just mentioned finished fourth, fifth, and sixth in the overall voting percentages. Adrian Beltre, Todd Helton, and Joe Maurer were all inducted into the Hall of Fame. Adrian Beltre and Joe Maurer being inducted um, on their first chance to get in. Todd Helton has been on the ballot for a while, and he finally gets in himself. So uh, I will be talking a little bit about Todd Helton and Joe Maurer uh, as we go down, because I'm going to dedicate this episode to looking at Andrew Jones and his candidacy for being in the Hall of Fame. I think he absolutely should be. You know, this is a Braves podcast. I don't pretend to be completely unbiased, but I try to provide as much evidence to back up some of my my takes as possible. And that's what I'm going to do today, guys. I think it's pretty ludicrous at this point that Andrew Jones has not been elected to the Hall of Fame. And I think he is a guy that you have to dig into the numbers. And um, it, I, I think he does present a trickier case for people who are not really paying attention. You would hope that national baseball writers would not be among that group, but unfortunately, the so-called experts sometimes aren't as expert as they present themselves to be. And I think this is one of those times where it's kind of obvious they're exposing themselves a little bit as not either not caring or not knowing as much as uh, they should about uh, particularly Andrew Jones, but generally about the guys they're voting for for the Hall of Fame. Uh, so, you know, Gary Sheffield exhausted his final chance of getting voted in by the writers. He is unlikely to be voted in by the Veterans Committee as well. There's some whispers, though less evidence, uh, direct evidence, that Sheffield was somehow um, had some connections to steroids. Uh, like I said, I don't think that's ever been directly proven. Uh, some of that, of course, is very difficult to prove. Um, and so the fact that Sheffield wasn't voted in by the writers, I think it's much less likely that he could be voted in by the Veterans Committee. If you don't know how the Veterans Committee works, um, it rotates every four years. A group of 16 former players and managers gets together. I think maybe even GMs are part of that. And they will vote on certain players who were not voted in by the writers. This, of course, is how uh, Fred McGriff was, was voted in. So I, I would expect Sheffield, because he came quite close. I mean, he was in the 60s in terms of percentage. Uh, he came fairly close to getting voted in by the writers. So I think his name will show up on the Veterans Committee um, votes. But I would be kind of surprised if he was ever voted in by that group. They're going to be even more sensitive to potential steroid use. Now, Billy Wagner also missed out by five votes and is likely, I think, very likely to be elected in his final year of eligibility. Next year, most players get uh, a bump in voting in their final year of voting, um, for whatever reason that is. Um, I think it also shows you um, some of the, the flaws in how the writers vote. I mean, if he's, if he, if he's good enough to get in, he should have got in his ninth year. Uh, who's holding back for that 10th year vote? I don't know. Um, it does stink for him to be only five votes short and not get in this year, uh, but I do think Billy Wagner will get in. So, you know, Sheffield only played a few years for the Braves. Wagner only played his final season uh, for the Braves. So, you know, these guys being Braves for only a short stint, I certainly kind of pull for them to get in, but but it's less of an emotional pull for me as for Andrew Jones. Andrew Jones is a Braves legend. He is you know, he recently had his number retired by the Braves. I think that was a long time coming, actually. Uh, but he he was honored in that way. 
So uh, what I'd like to do in this episode, again, is to provide as much of a complete argument for Andrew being a Hall of Famer as possible. So Andrew Jones, uh, having not gotten in this year, now has three more years of eligibility remaining uh, to get in to be voted in by the writers. And while his election may still be more likely than not, uh, I am definitely getting a little frustrated by uh, the writers not getting it, not understanding the greatness of Andrew Jones. So here are a few things about the Hall of Fame voters that are becoming obvious to me. Uh, I'm going to give you four, four things that are becoming obvious to me about the baseball writers. Uh, number one, some take voting very seriously and put a great deal of thought and effort into their vote. They, they feel that it's a deep honor to vote for the Hall of Fame. And I think others simply don't honor the responsibility at all. They either don't care, um, don't put any thought into it, or simply have no clue about who they are voting on. Uh, number two, I don't think voters value, or sorry, I think voters value offense much more than they value defense and defensive-minded players like Andrew Jones, except when they randomly don't, right? So there are uh, there are Hall, Hall of Famers like Ozzie Smith who are in the Hall of Fame pretty strictly for their defensive greatness, defensive ability, um, but it seems very random as to who they're willing to honor with those, um, uh, you know, those elections and who they are not. And of course, Andrew right now is on the wrong side of that. Uh, number three, national writers aren't the experts that they want us to think they are. <laughs> I've kind of felt this and known this for a while. If you ever listen to uh, national sports writers or sports guys in their podcasts or interviews or whatever, it seems very obvious that they don't know your team as well as you know your team. You know, And, and some of that is just going to be natural. If you're covering 30 teams, you can't dive deeply. You can't know everything about these teams. If you follow your your beloved team, um, you know year round, then you're going to know more than those national sports writers, and it shows up in votes like this. I guarantee you. I mean, it's probably not an exaggeration for me to say that I saw 97 percent of Andrew Jones's games when he was with the Braves, um, and that was his prime years. Uh, so I think I have a really strong. Obviously, I have a strong opinion of it, but I think I have a really strong grasp of how good Andrew Jones was. Uh, Braves fans simply know Andrew better than national writers do. Um, and you can't possibly understand Andrew's defensive greatness, especially if you did not watch him every day. I think Andrew is one of those players, especially, that had to be watched every day to truly appreciate him. You know, some guys show up on highlights and, and on Sports Center every night. Andrew had plenty of highlights for sure defensively, but there were a, ton, a lot of his defensive greatness would never make Sports Center because he was so good at anticipating balls off the bat that what another center fielder would have to dive for and, and make a top 10 Sports Center play, he could just cruise and catch it on his feet. And uh, you know, so much of his greatness, I think, is was truly never appreciated except by those who watched him every day and understood his game on that level. All right, and then my, my last thing that is that has become obvious to me about these national sports writers who are voting for the Hall of Fame is that writers value players who retire early at the top of their game and then seem to hold it against players who struggle through their final few years. And this is obviously the story of Andrew Jones, right? After his year 30 season, he declined greatly. He never really had another great year. Uh, he had maybe one solid offensive year, uh, but his his legs were gone. His body was starting to fail him. And uh, defensively, he was pretty much done after 30. And so, look, I don't want the Hall of Fame to be watered down or easy to get into. I don't and, and I'm going to try to make this argument. I don't believe at all that I am lowering the standards of the Hall of Fame of the Hall of Fame by arguing for Andrew Jones's induction. Um, but it does not take much to see that Andrew is worthy of induction. There are other center fielders that you can argue should not have ever been inducted into the Hall of Fame. 
Andrew Jones is much better than those guys. Uh, I'm going to give you first uh, my top reasons that Andrew should have already been inducted. Um, but I don't, again, I don't want to ignore his negatives. So actually, let, let me do that first, okay? Let's address uh, Andrew Jones's negatives, what kind of go against him for his induction, and maybe what's causing some people not to vote for him. But again, I think these are more surface level, and people are not digging in to all the good reasons. Okay, so there's two big reasons I want to dive into those. The first reason on the negative side for Andrew Jones is that he was a good but not great offensive player. And I think this is legitimate. I really do. Um, you know, Andrew did not hit the 2000 hit mark for his career. Uh, he had 1,933 hits at the end of his career. He only hit for a 254 average, which would be pretty low for someone in the Hall of Fame. He had a 111 OPS. Um, sorry, I think that's a 111 runs created plus. Uh, and that does not look like a Hall of Famer, right? On the surface, those numbers do not look like Hall of Fame numbers. Um, I, I did, even before Andrew got to the point where he could be voted for the Hall of Fame, like right after he finished his career, you know, I started thinking about Andrew for Hall of Fame. I always thought that he was maybe one year short of being offensively, being a very obvious, like no doubt Hall of Famer. Um, you know, get over the 2000 hit mark get over 450 home runs. He he ended with 434 home runs. So some of those counting stats, yeah, he could have gotten a little bit better with, you know, if he had had one more great season or played one more uh, one more year at the end. Uh, I'll also admit, offensively, Andrew Jones was a kind of frustrating player. I mean, he was one of my favorite players all the time. I always pulled for Andrew. I loved Andrew, but his approach at the plate was somewhat frustrating. You know, they would throw him that down and away slider. He'd chase it a lot. Um, he became a lower average pure power hitter um, near the end of his time with the Braves. Now, he was hitting a lot of home runs uh, at the end of his time with the Braves, but he definitely kind of sacrificed some of that pure hitting um, approach going the other way and that sort of thing for the pure power. I also think if he had kept slimmer and maybe focused on that line drive approach, he probably could have extended his career uh, and his offensive profile would have looked different. Maybe he doesn't hit as many home runs, but he's more of an all-around player. And again, if he, he, he did get a little heavy near the end of his time with the Braves and, and his final seasons after the Braves, and certainly that was not good on his knees and, and uh, his ability to extend his career. Now, I don't know the reasons for that. I'm not going to sit here and judge him for that. But I think there's probably a, a legitimate argument to be made. If you look at Andrew when he first comes up um, as a 19-year-old, and then even through his like 24, 25 seasons, he's a slimmer guy, obviously incredibly athletic, faster, could steal you some bases. And that really went away. Um and I have no doubt, put a lot more pressure on his body in center field uh, later in his career. So yeah, he was a good but not great offensive player, and I think that is legitimate. Um, the other negative to Andrew is he didn't have one good season after the age of 30. So he really truly did drop off drastically after he leaves Atlanta. It's just simply true. I think um, again, if he had taken a little better care of his body uh, or stayed slimmer, I think that would have helped him a lot. Uh, but, you know, this also totally ignores who Andrew Jones was. Like, if you watched Andrew Jones from the time he came up through the time he left Atlanta, this guy put his body on the line every day. He played center field with absolute abandon. Uh, he was diving for balls constantly, you know, taking away singles when he came in on the ball. Um, and, you know, the, and generally, I think it ignores the the pounding that center fielders put on themselves and the fact that it is a far more physically demanding position than probably every other position outside of catcher. So I think, you know, for one reason or for one thing, I think center fielders really should be judged more like catchers are. Um, and certainly I think Joe Maurer had that benefit of, um, of the riders looking at him as a catcher and, and some of his numbers tail off the end of his career because 
of the pounding that catchers have. And uh, I think it's totally real that Andrew Jones uh, took a pounding early in his career. And by the time he was 30, his body just wasn't quite the same and couldn't do those things that he could do so, so well in his early days. Um, you know, I think we're even seeing that now with Mike Trout. Uh, he's he's experiencing more injuries and as tremendously great, I'll, I'll mention him in a little bit more, but uh, as tremendously great as he has been, one of the greatest center fielders of all time, uh, we're starting to see here he is in his early 30s, uh, not being able to stay on the field as consistently. Uh, now, his when he is on the field, he's still at a higher level uh, than Andrew was after 30. But I'm I'm interested to see how Trout is able to close out his career over the next you know five to seven years. Is he able to to play deep into his 30s, and and will he continue to play in the outfield? Will he DH more? That sort of thing. Okay, guys. So there are 19 men who have been inducted into the Hall of Fame whose primary positions was center field. Their primary position was center field. Only nine center fielders have been inducted from the post-World War II era. So that's kind of amazing to me, actually. Center field uh, has been a position that is underrepresented in the Hall of Fame generally. So think about that. Only nine men since World War II uh, in that era have been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, three pre-World War II center fielders uh, you will know the name of, uh, especially if you are uh, a lover of baseball and baseball history. Uh, so those three are Hack Wilson, Tris Speaker, and Ty Cobb. So, you know, some of the other guys I'd actually never even heard of before, you know, just way, way back in the day, um, early 1900s. So I'm not going to spend time on guys who were pre-World War II just because it was such a different game, different style of game, that sort of thing. But I do want to mention each of the post-World War II center fielders who are either in the Hall of Fame or you know, are very likely to be in the Hall of Fame here in the next several years, okay? And I want to go through them uh, chronologically, and I'm just going to mention a couple things with each of them. Uh, obviously, I, this could turn into an hours and hours long episode if I really dove deep into each of these guys. So I'm just going to give you guys their um, career uh, F war, so by fan graphs, and I'm going to give you their career runs uh, weighted runs created plus their WRC plus. And, you know, for the older players, um, you know, before TV, um, I don't know how accurate war can really be. I'm still going to give that to you, but obviously I think war is pretty accurate offensively, but defensive war, I think is a little trickier for those guys. That's why I want to give you at least their offensive numbers with their uh, weighted runs created plus. I think that can be very accurate just based off of their stats. Um, okay, so so let's go down the list. So uh, the first of these guys is Joe DiMaggio. Uh, Joe DiMaggio uh, started playing in 1936. Uh, his final year was 1951. Um, and he lost three years of his prime to World War II. And, you know, several of these guys, these greats like him and, and uh Ted Williams lost years due to war. Uh, so DiMaggio, even with losing three years, uh, calculates to a 82.6 career war, and he had a 151 runs created plus. Uh, Larry Doby, uh, the first African-American to play in the American League. He played from 1947 through 1959, a little bit of a shorter career, 60.8 um, F war and a 140 runs, uh, weighted runs created plus. Uh, Duke Snyder played for the Dodgers mostly uh, 1947 to 1964, a 63.5 war and a 139 WRC plus. Richie Ashburn, uh, 1948 to 1962, 57.4 war. That's uh, on the lower end of uh, these Hall of Famers. And a 115 WRC plus also on the low end. Uh, Mickey Mantle, of course, Mickey Mantle, 1951 through 1968, an amazing 112.3 war and 170 WRC plus. That's the highest of any center fielder in history, uh, at least of these uh, post-World War II guys. 
Um, Robin, or sorry, I'm, how do I skip Willie Mays? Willie Mays, 1951 through 1973, 149.8 war and 154 uh, WRC plus. So Willie Mays has the highest war of any center fielder in history. Um, he has the second highest weighted runs created plus of any center fielder in history. Of course, we know that he was also uh, one of the top two or three center fielders to ever play the game defensively. So Willie Mays, um, probably a top three or four player of all time. Uh, many people would actually choose him as the top player of all time. So, um, yeah, quite amazing. Uh, Robin Yount, 1974 through 1993, uh, 66.5 uh, F war and a 113 WRC plus. So definitely on the lower end there. Yount played for uh, 20 seasons. Uh, so he definitely compiled a lot of numbers. Andre Dawson, 1976 through 1996. So again, a lot of seasons there. Uh, he had a 59.5 F war and a 117 WRC plus. Kirby Puckett, 1984 to 1995, a 44.9 uh, F war. That's the lowest of any of these guys. A 122 weighted runs created plus. You know, you got to mention with Kirby Puckett, his career was cut short due to some eye issues. So I, he, he certainly was inducted with the idea that he could have kept playing and probably, you know, had um, more good seasons left in the tank. Uh, but it still should be noted that here he is uh, in a 12-year career. And this I'm going to talk about Kirby Puckett more in relation to Andrew Jones uh, in a little bit. But in a 12-year career, uh, he you know accumulated 44.9 F war. I'll get into his numbers uh, more specifically later. Um, uh, you know, a very good hitter. Uh, 122 WRC plus is very good. Uh, but he's just an, an an interesting one to look at when we talk about Andrew. Uh, King Griffey Jr., uh, 1989 through 2010, 77.7 F war, 131 uh, WRC plus. Uh, then you get to Andrew, right? King Griffey Jr. and Andrew were, were basically uh, right around the same time. They both retired in 2010. Andrew comes up in 1996. He has a 67.0 F war and a 111 WRC plus. So here you go with Andrew. Uh, you notice that his his F war number is right in line. It's on the lower end, maybe a little bit, but it's right in line with a lot of these guys. I mean, other than the the greats of all time like DiMaggio and Mantle and Mays, he's kind of right there with everybody else. He does have the lowest uh, WRC plus, meaning you know in terms of his offensive numbers. Uh, but, of course, we're going to get into the greatness of his uh, center field defense here in a little bit. All right, and then two other guys. Carlos Beltran is on the ballot with Andrew Jones now. A lot of people think he might actually get inducted next year. He had a 67.8 uh, F war for his career and a 118 WRC+. plus. So I just want you to let that sink in as well. Carlos Beltran played for 20 seasons uh, far more seasons than Andrew Jones. He did have a better offensive career, um, but when you dive into any other numbers defensively, Andrew Jones puts him to shame. So uh, I think they're both deserving, but um, anyways, I wanted to mention that one as well. And then finally, of course, Mike Trout, who's still going to be playing for quite a few more years. Um, he came up in 2011, and here we are through his 2023 season. Trout has earned 85.1 F war and has an astonishing 170 WRC plus, which actually does tie him with Mickey Mantle. But you might assume that that's going to go down a little bit in his later years and won't be quite as high as Mantle. But that does tell you how incredibly special Mike Trout is. And I mean, he has the potential to finish as one of the greatest center fielders uh, of all time, maybe even one of the greatest baseball players of all time. It kind of depends on how his um, last few seasons go. So of these 10 players, Andrew is the weakest overall offensively. Um, just the, the numbers don't lie, uh, but he's not a bad offensive player by any means. Um, of course, Willie Mays is the only one, even in the ballpark of Andrew's defensive greatness, who's on this list. 
Um, and I think that's really important. Now, some of you might be throwing out King Griffey Jr. He won 10 gold gloves. Kirby Puckett actually won uh, six gold gloves. Uh, and a lot of people will bring up, especially Griffey, as also being in the conversation of one of the greats defensively of all time. And what I would say to that is gold gloves, I think, actually do Andrew Jones a disservice. So Andrew Jones also won 10 gold gloves. It seems just by that metric that him and King Griffey Jr. are maybe even defensively. But if you believe in Fangraph's um, defensive metrics at all, which again, as you get into more modern times, it's, it's far more, I think, believable, right? You can follow their metrics defensively a lot more with Griffey and with Andrew. Um, Griffey and Kirby Puckett actually grayed out very negatively by fan graphs. And I'm, I'm certain a lot of that is their later seasons, but um, it's, it's still, you know, Andrew is by far by far and away, the greatest defensive center fielder of all time, according to fan graphs. Um, and if you don't believe me on that, check it out. Willie Mays is number two, but by, by like a really far distance, he's number two. Um, so even on paper, when I say um, some of those names that I mentioned, you know, those Hall of Famers, I think some are clearly first ballot, top tier, all-time greats like Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays, um, Joe DiMaggio, uh, even M Mike Trout. But others are even or even well under Andrew Jones. I mean, that's just how I see it. So let's, let's keep diving into this, guys. It should be said that many of these center fielders, these great all-time center fielders, played many years or at least the back end of their careers at other positions like first base or like DH. Now, Andrew also had a couple of those years uh, by the end. He, he finished his career with the Yankees and was playing predominantly DH in his final year. Uh, his other years, he's, he was more of like left field, so still playing in the outfield a good bit um, down the stretch of his career. But you have a lot of these guys who who slide over to first base or if, in their, if they're in the American League, they're able to, able to take some days off and play play DH and save their legs. I didn't even realize this. Mickey Mantle, actually, his last two seasons, he played first base for the Yankees. So that can extend careers. And Andrew, I don't know, you know, maybe he could have slid to DH or, or, or taken days off and, and done that a little more often earlier in his career. I do think in the end, he had sacrificed so much of his body to the Braves um, and winning division championships and vying for World Series championships that he was probably pretty broken down by the time he left Atlanta. So that, that's just one other um, point I wanted to make. So let's go ahead and get into the arguments for Andrew Jones uh, that he is a legitimate Hall of Famer. All right, so the number one argument um, that I think is rock solid is that he is the greatest defensive center fielder in baseball history. And I would say he's the greatest center fielder in baseball history by a lot. Um, Fangraph metrics back that up. Um, I've always believed that. Of course, I didn't have the ability to watch Willie Mays. That's the other guy that everybody's going to bring up. Look, Willie Mays, I've already said this. He's one of probably the top three or four greatest baseball players in the history of baseball. Put him up there with Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron. And if you want to put some other modern guys up there too, that's fine. But Willie Mays deserves to be up there. Um, he was great in every aspect of the game. Um, but Andrew Jones and Willie Mays himself, you know, I mean, a lot of people are bringing this up, but Willie Mays himself told Terry Pendleton, he's the greatest I've ever seen. Now, maybe he was saying that and just humbly excluding himself. Um, or maybe he was saying, no, he was better than me. Uh, there's no like sit down interview with Willie Mays where, where we can hear that. But, um, again, the Fangraphs metrics, um, the eye test, if you saw Andrew play day in, day out, you just start to think, I don't really understand how anyone could ever be this good or better than what Andrew's doing out there. Um, you know, he played that shallow defense where he took away so many singles. He'd make so many diving catches 
uh, to take away singles that no one would have been anywhere close to. And he was able to do that because he had elite anticipation and could go back on the ball and cover behind himself so well uh, that he just got to almost everything. Uh, he also played with some not so great defensive outfielders that he covered for quite often. You know, when Chipper was out there playing left field, Chipper himself will tell you he, he wasn't a very good left fielder. Uh, Ryan Klusko was out there. Um, uh, there's some other guys kind of late in Andrew's time that he had to cover for. And that was just uh, part of the deal. But, but yeah, Willie Mays endorsed Andrew Jones. And again, watching him, uh, I just can't imagine there being anyone better. I know Griffey has some tremendous highlights. Um, Andrew didn't have as many uh, robberies of home runs because he played so shallow. He could get to the wall. I think there were a few times where, uh, you know, he wasn't able to rob a home run because of how shallow he played, but everything else he could just do um, just so well. I mean, you know, the Spider-Man catch or that catch in Milwaukee or not Milwaukee, Montreal that is so famous uh, to close out a Tom Glavin complete game and win the game for the Braves. I mean, there's so many uh, there, one. And I think Andrew thought his greatest catch was um, against the Phillies at Veterans Stadium. But you can look at all these highlights, and it, it's jaw-dropping of what he was able to do. So, yeah, my number one argument is that if Andrew Jones is the greatest center fielder of all time, probably that in of itself should put him in the Hall of Fame. But that's not the only thing, right? Number two, Andrew Jones had 11 years from 97 through 2007 of extreme excellence. Uh, better than many of these other Hall of Famers. So again, and you could put 96 in there too. You know, 96 was his rookie year. Of course, he hits the two home runs in the World Series, which is so memorable as a teenager. Um, still the youngest guy to ever hit two home runs in a World Series game. But, but you have uh, those years are basically uh, his years as a Brave. Um, those, those years are, are dominant. Uh, they are so so high level, and that's what a lot of people will look at with Hall of Famers. Did you have 10, 11, 12 years of dominance, of excellence? And Andrew certainly has that. In those 11 years, from 97 through 2007, he won 10 gold gloves. Now, 97, he played left and right field because the Braves had Kenny Lofton for that year. So in 98, he moves over to center field, and from that point, he wins 10 straight gold gloves. Uh, in those years, though, just in those 11 years, he also hits uh, 363 home runs, which, uh, of course, is an average of 33 home runs a year. He hits 1,104 RBIs, which is an average of 10, or sorry, of 100 RBIs a year. He uh, has 1,034 runs, an average of 94 runs per year. Um, and during those 11 years, he ranked third in Major League Baseball in F War behind A Rod and Barry Bonds. And hmm, what do those two have in common? Oh, they were on steroids most of that time. So, you know, and who was number four? Chipper Jones was number four during that time. So, Andrew Jones, for that 11 year stretch, if you remove the two guys on steroids, he's the greatest player in baseball for an 11 year stretch. How is this guy not in the Hall of Fame? Um, he also had some great offensive seasons. So even though for his career, he doesn't necessarily rank as, a, as an all-time great offensively, he did have seasons that really stood out. So the first one is the year 2000. He hit 303, uh, which is the highest batting average he ever had for a season. 303, uh, 366 on base with a 541 slugging percentage. He hit 36 home runs, 104 RBIs. Of course, he won the gold glove. He finished eighth in the MVP that year, which was really a disservice to him because he was second in F war in the National League in that season. Uh, in 2005, this is, of course, is the season which really I think he should have won the MVP. Uh, he hit 263 with a 347 on base percentage, 575 slugging percentage. This is the year he hit 51 home runs, 128 RBIs, won the gold glove in center field. Uh, and finished second in the MVP vote to Albert Pujols, uh, even though he was first in the National League in F War uh, that year. Um, and I've always wondered too. That's another one I shouldn't have mentioned. But if he had won that 
MVP, it's one of those things that people think, well, Joe Maurer won, won one MVP. Uh, that's kind of puts him over the top as a Hall of Famer. You know, I always thought if Andrew had been awarded that MVP, which I really think he deserved, uh, maybe he's in the Hall of Fame already. And then in 2006, he backed up that year with another great year. He hit 262, uh, 363 on base, so improved that. 351 um, slugging percentage, he hit 41 home runs, 129 RBIs, won the gold glove in center field, uh, finished 11th in the MVP, even though he was fifth in the NL in, um, in war. So, you know, he had some tremendous seasons. 06 was really his last great season he finished uh, one more year with the Braves and then he was kind of on his steep decline now let me go ahead and talk about that decline a, a little bit more right his quick his quick decline after the age of 30 has to be put in the context of his position and the way he sacrificed his body for the team uh, you know I've already mentioned a lot of this but you know coming in diving in, in so many balls and just the um, you know, to, to steal singles and, and hits away from, from the other team and, and just how he played center field. And if you watched him every day, you understood the punishment his body took playing the game the way he did. Um, so if Andrew had just looked in the mirror at the age of 30 and he knew he was, you know, the Braves weren't going to bring him back. And if he had just decided, you know what, I've had a great run. I'm going to retire at the age of 30. Um, I think he's probably in the Hall of Fame right now because it seems like, and I've already mentioned this, but it seems like Hall of Fame voters like you to make that call and retire early in your prime instead of trying to go out and still play the game you love. Um, so now I want to uh, kind of, you know, this is like a multiverse Spider-Man situation. Let's imagine in a different world, Andrew had hung it up after uh, 2007 okay and I want to um, contrast or compare his career at that point to some other Hall of Famers all right so Andrew from the age of 19 through the age of 30 with the Atlanta Braves uh, managed 64.2 F war um, again uh, he was second in MVP voting in 2005 uh, during that stretch, right, during his entire Braves career, he hit 279 with a 342 on base and a 497 slugging percentage, almost 500 slugging percentage, 368 home runs, 1,045 RBIs, and at that point, 114 weighted runs created plus. Uh, he had managed 10 gold gloves in a row, and uh, this is clearly the greatest. Uh, stretch of outfield defense in the history of baseball. So he retires at 30 with that, right? And and we don't have any images of Andrew in decline, uh, you know, Andrew being a part-time left fielder, part-time DH uh, with Texas or, or with uh, the Chicago White Sox or, or with the Yankees. Now let's uh, compare him to a few other guys. I already mentioned Kirby Puckett, whose career also, Kirby Puckett's career uh, spanned 12 seasons. 1984 through 1995. This was uh, Kirby from the age of 24 through the age of 35. He served as Minnesota's primary center fielder. Of course, he won two World Series. The 91 World Series will will always, um, you know, be uh, will always make us a little depressed as, as Braves fans. Uh, but I've already mentioned this. He managed 44.9 F WAR. So again, about 15 WAR less than Andrew during this time. He retired due to retina damage in his right eye. So definitely probably retired a couple years early, but he was nine or he was 35. So he wasn't crazy young at this point. Um, his overall career numbers, he hit 318 with a 360 on base percentage and a 477 slugging percentage, uh, 207 career home runs, uh, 1,085 career RBIs and a career 122 WRC plus. And like I mentioned, he won six gold gloves. Uh, so, you know, Kirby, yes, he was a better overall hitter. He hit for a much higher average than Andrew, though Andrew's career average plummeted greatly um, because he stayed in the game uh, those basically five years longer um, than then we're saying maybe he should have in, in this scenario. Um, 
but uh, he definitely was not the power hitter that Andrew was. Uh, he had a lower slugging percentage, far fewer home runs. Um, and as I've already mentioned, he doesn't grade out as well defensively as those six gold gloves suggest. All right, now let's go to, um, actually, let me just mention another guy, even though it's very hard to compare this guy. But the other guy that is very famous for being a Hall of Famer who retired early was Sandy Koufax. Of course, Sandy Koufax is a pitcher, uh, a great all-time pitcher, but you know he only played from the ages of 19 to 30, which just happened to be the years in which Andrew played for the Braves, 19 to 30. Uh, he averaged 33 starts per season during this stretch, um, and he won he won three Cy Youngs. He won an MVP. Uh, he managed 54.5 F WAR again, according to Fangraphs. And uh, so 54.5 compared to Andrew's 64.2. I'm just saying, guys, Sandy Koufax is revered. Am I saying that Sandy Koufax shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame? No, it's the opposite. It's that Andrew deserves to be. All right, let's look at another guy. Now, these next two guys, I want to compare to Andrew simply because they were just elected to the Hall of Fame. So Joe Maurer, Joe Maurer, the catcher from Minnesota, um, you know, he had now he played more seasons than just the 12, but really after um, his top 12 seasons, he's in decline as well. He moves from catcher and primarily as a first baseman in DH in the last several years of his career. So from the from his age 21 through 32 seasons, uh, Joe Maurer managed 48.1 F war. He did win an MVP during this period, but again, in 12 seasons, 48.1 war compared to Andrews 64.2. I'm just saying guys, um, his offensive totals. He, um, he's a better offensive player overall than Andrew 313 average, uh, 394 on base percentage, 451 slugging percentage, um, he wasn't a huge home run hitter, only hit 119 home runs, seven, 755 RBIs. But from the catching position, yeah, sure, he was pretty great, but he definitely had a shorter career. He won three gold gloves, so very solid behind the plate. But um, it is remarkable, remarkable to me that Joe Maurer can be voted in a first ballot Hall of Famer with those numbers. I'm not saying he's not a Hall of Famer, but how does Joe Maurer get voted in first ballot and Andrew Jones is sitting here on the seventh ballot still waiting to get in? Um, it, it, guys, it just baffles me. Okay, and the last guy I want to mention is Todd Helton, also getting in this year. So let's look at his age 24 through 35 seasons. Again, this is the, um, the prime of his career, 12 seasons. Uh, he is playing first base, a far less taxing position. Um, he is getting to hit um, at Coors Field in half of his games. And in those 12 seasons, he managed 53.7 F4, which is great for a first baseman. Um, and his offensive numbers are spectacular. 329 average, uh, 428 on base percentage, and a 568 slugging percentage during those years. 320 home runs, which is still fewer than Andrew, Andrew did, uh, 1,191 RBIs, a 140 WRC+. Plus. So a supreme hitter. Uh, he won three gold gloves during this time. Um, is he a Hall of Famer? Yeah, I actually, I think Todd Helton is. I think it's legitimate that he had to wait a little while to be a Hall of Famer. But still, his impact on the game, according to Fangraphs, is far less than Andrew Jones and of course Andrew's um Andrew's uh you know what he's doing on the field his his defensive contributions are so much greater um than Todd Helton's would be at first base so look ultimately I believe if any of the following had happened in Andrew's career he would have already easily been voted in if he had retired early after his age 30 season and we didn't have those final years of Andrew declining in our minds, um, I think he's easily a Hall of Famer. He's the Sandy Koufax of our generation in, in those terms. Uh, if he had stopped, and this one annoys me, but I think it's true. If he'd stopped sacrificing his body so much, 
if he didn't dive as much on defense, if he moved to a corner outfield position earlier and, you know, just kind of chilled out in a corner outfield position for his career um, and just made sure that he was healthy, um, he probably would have been able to play longer and, um, you know, accumulate more stats. Uh, but that's not how Andrew played, and I appreciate that that's not how Andrew played. He put his body on the line for his team. Uh, if he had put together one more great season in his 30s, I think that's probably all it would have taken to, um, you know, re remind people late in his career how great he had been early in his career. But, you know, he, he was kind of done. His body was pretty much done in his 30s. Look, ultimately, guys, Andrew deserves to be in the Hall of Fame compared to the center fielders who are already in the Hall of Fame and compared to the recent players voted in even the first ballot, Joe Maurer. Um, I think especially looking at Joe Maurer and how he got in, it just makes me scratch my head for Andrew. So to close, um, here's my list of all-time center fielders, and I'm going to just say post-World War II, so we are excluding the greats like Tris Speaker and Ty Cobb. And you can, you can disagree with my list, obviously, but this is how I see it. Uh, Willie Mays, number one, you know, one of the greatest – Offensive center fielders, one of the greatest defensive center fielders. He had it all. Uh, number two, Joe DiMaggio. So um, he doesn't have quite the numbers, but losing three years of your prime to go fight heroically in World War II um, is pretty darn impressive. And, um, and so I'm putting Joe DiMaggio number two. He was a better defensive uh, player than my number three, than Mickey Mantle. Um, and uh, maybe slightly less hitter because Mickey was probably the greatest uh, offensive center fielder of all time, but still, DiMaggio gets my number two. Mickey Mantle gets my number three. Um, and Mantle very famously, you know, kind of devolved late in his career. Uh, he admitted to just tremendous alcoholism, and I do wonder if he had been able to stay healthy for a number more years. Mickey Mantle might be considered maybe even the greatest player of all time, but didn't go that way. Number four, I have Mike Trout, and I think especially if he's able to finish his career, um, you know, and play healthy for five, six, seven more years, maybe he actually overtakes Mickey Mantle for number three. He's he's really that great. Uh, number five is Ken Griffey Jr. Again, after he left Seattle the first time, he just wasn't quite the same player in Cincinnati. We all kind of know that, but still a, a tremendous player, over 600 home runs. Uh, Duke Snyder, number six. Larry Doby, number seven. They are very similar in terms of just great hitters. Larry Doby had uh, a few less, uh, a few less seasons than Duke Snyder. Um, then I have Andrew Jones, number eight, and I think Andrew Jones is the eighth greatest overall center fielder of all time and the greatest defensive center fielder of all time. I have Robin Yount just under Andrew Jones, and I have Carlos Beltran. Uh, number 10. Now, fan graphs would generally agree with me on those last two, by the way. So Robin Yount had just a little less in terms of war. Carlos Beltran has just a little more, like just barely a little more than Andrew Jones, but he played 20 seasons. And a lot of those seasons were not in center field. Uh, so he was able to, to compile a lot more numbers than Andrew. So look, Andrew is clearly a top 10 center fielder all time for me. Even if you put Tris Speaker and Ty Cobb in this top 10 and move out Robin Yount and Carlos Beltran, I still have Andrew Jones number 10. Okay, so he's a top 10, top 10 center fielder of all time. Again, he's the greatest center fielder of all time, and he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Anyone who does not vote for Andrew for the Hall of Fame, I don't think they understand his career or they have a good understanding of the history of the game of baseball. He deserves it. Um, if Ozzie Smith is in as a shortstop, Andrew Jones is in. If you look at a list of the greatest defensive players of all time from fan graphs, you know, every position is going to have like different value. You can get the most value to be uh, of being a great shortstop. So if you look at that list, Andrew's in the top 10. There's no other outfielder anywhere close um, in that list. It's shortstops. It's a couple, uh, couple catchers and it's Andrew Jones. Um, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, it's taken too long. He does have three more years left, guys, but man, he he needs to get in, and Hall of Fame voters need to wake up. Well, Braves fans, I hope you enjoyed this episode of State of the Braves, and uh, look, 
the off season is uh, is winding down. I mean, we're getting close to spring training. Uh, anytime you you getting close to February, you're getting close to pitchers and catchers reporting. So that's a good thing, and I'm really looking forward to that day. So you guys have a great one. I'll talk to you soon.